Thank you so much, Jamie, for having me here. Um, like I said, I'll just get started. Um, I'm gonna try by sharing my screen. Okay, here we go. Oh my God, I'm sorry, it's my first thing. Hold on, <laughs> one second, Jamie. <laughs> I, I had it set up, hold on a second. I gotta re redo this. Um, one second, one second, guys. All right. Okay, here we go. Check this earpiece out. I, really, I was uh, making this more of a performance piece. Um, can everyone see my screen? The... Okay, hold on a second. Ugh. No, you just want to hit present, Munsur. Yeah, I know. It's funny. I just got the nerve. That was a great uh, opening to me in my first slide. <laughs> me. <clears throat> so, like I said, a lot of talks that I've been to and given and heard always start with like an institution or the academy as a departure point for the conversation. But I realized for me, it's like, I have to go back in time. So one thing you'll notice when I give a talk is like, there's gonna be lots of, it's not gonna be linear. So it's gonna be like a little bit of time travel, um, some non sequiturs that hopefully come back to this, uh, the stream that I'm having. <laughs> but anyway, this is where I met Jamie, like I said, at the University of New Mexico. But I felt like my real education, or my real foundation for an art was um, at home. So my parents were both um, artists. Like my dad uh, went to the Art Institute of Chicago. He also played with the AACM in the beginning. My mom was a storyteller and went to Carleton College. But the, the places we lived in usually were uh, like lower socioeconomic neighborhoods in, in Chicago. And I, I brought this, this is like one of the apartments we lived in. This was the one I wasn't born in, but it was like the second apartment I lived in from the time I was like two years old until I was like 10. But for me, I just remember like, like just being in an environment where there was like so much happening, even though it's vacant now, and that's, that's a whole other story, but just about like, how there was so much stimulus and so many inputs. And just like, I don't know, like it was so active. Like now my, my work is about like smell and memory, but this, when I think about this time, it's about sound, sound and, and what I saw. Um, so one thing, <laughs> I brought up this eBay picture. A lot of my pictures are I like this one. I'm like, this is something I, I really liked. And I was thinking about like identity formation. Um, like when I was a child, I went to like a lot of Pan-African schools and it was like learning about black history, like uh, where, where Africans in that diaspora. And one of the things I got into were like comic books. And these were like golden legacy comic books that I was like obsessed with when I was a child. Um, so another piece of my life was like waiting, waiting around a lot. Like my dad always had me waiting. My mom always had me waiting. My grandfather always had me waiting. But one of the places I really like I didn't realize was important to me until like later on was this is where my grandfather worked. So my grandfather was a tailor and his father before him was also a tailor involved in sewing. But this is a place I would go meet my grandfather and he worked in the back of this pride cleaners on 79th and St. Lawrence. Uh, I just remember like navigating the carousels, the smell of the cleaning fjord and just watching him work. Um, like he was someone that was really important to me, but like a lot of uh, figures that I had, like I didn't feel like I learned much fr like from from like from him directly, but it was like being around him that I learned so much. Like so, mainly I think it was the sewing piece and being patient and really kind. Um, so <laughs> this is fast forwarding a lot. So uh, my practice, like I, like I didn't mention before, but my practice was a lot about like just my life, like my. My art and my life aren't like separated from, it's like my art is expression or me processing what's happening in my life. And so when I was in school with Jamie, um, that, was, that was a period where it was like separation from my family of origin. So I was like learning, like trying to develop myself. And I think it was really co uh, complicated and confusing as well, like being in New Mexico. I went to high school for one year, but I was like trying to establish myself as an individual because I had gone from this environment where it was like homogeneously black, it was all black 
to like on the other end of the spectrum where it was like I was usually one of only one or two black people whenever I was in places or at things. Um, so when I was in school, it was like all these inputs, learning about art history, learning about art. I feel like I really didn't have a voice, but it was just like, just being there was so important and having access and just putting in the time. So one of the, one of the first ways I actually met Jamie or met you was, I just remember being at the art building, like just being there late at night. Like sometimes I didn't know what, what my voice is, what I was doing, but just realizing I had to put in the work to like make paintings for uh, Michael Cook's class or like printmaking or photography classes. And one of the, I don't know, that was just so important, just that time, like putting in the time, like even though the final project was like derivative or wasn't original, it was just like putting in time to create something. And so when I finished uh, college, like not having access to a painting studio, even though I really love painting and photography, I started just, I, I found these Polaroid land cameras and just documenting my life. Like, I felt like that was something I had to do. I don't, I don't know why, or it was just, I just felt compelled to do it. It was just like, so these are like people that were significant to me at the time. Like my friend, Bert Harrington, his friend, Mark, a friend of mine, Eric, my dad, my friend, Arazi and some other people. Um, and I think this is the day my dad actually gave me a small container of clove oil and I don't know, he was like, you should use it for your gums. But later on, it was like, that became my love affair with clove oil shortly after this. Um, this is more like documentation of what was happening in my life at the time. Um, so when I left New Mexico, I moved to Tucson for a little bit. And one of the great things about being in Tucson for me was like, I had these Polaroid camera, this one Polaroid camera, but then because of so many retirees and snowboards, birds who came to Tucson to, to winter, that there were always tons of Polaroid cameras at thrift stores. And I found a couple of uh, photo supply stores that had exhausted film. And so I just began like documenting everything I saw. Um, and this was like, again, it was about maintaining my practice, even though I didn't have access to like a painting studio, a printmaking lab or a photo lab. And I was usually didn't have much money. Um, and then I moved to Berkeley, continue my practice. And this was, I'm not showing this because of like, the imagery per se, but just because it was like, this was my first kind of use of found materials. So I was working out as a bus boy at a restaurant. And um, I just remember I had shoe polish. I mean, I always had shoe polish because I had to have shine shoes. And then I just decided to start painting with it and made this portrait. Um, and this was the first like art I'd made. And like, I don't know, I, I graduated in 1997 or I think 96, 97. And then I, this is the first thing I made in like three years. So like those on the wall, cause it was the first time I had like a room of my own and a place to make art. Um, and then again, this is like my art continuing, like making do with what I had. So like doing a lot of journaling, a lot of like, like not art in a studio, but just, I don't know, just again, trying to figure out my life and where I was at the time. Um, oh, you were naughty while daddy was outside. Was that me? Oh, okay. Um, so this was, this was again, like, again, playing in the sketchbook, like trying to be, do things that are more abstract instead of just drawings and sketchings. Um, again, more Polaroids. And this was uh, when I kind of just started sewing. So this started when I was like uh, busing and at Spangers in West Berkeley. And a couple of blocks away was a place that, uh, had old truck inner tubes and I I don't know I just remember saying like thinking like oh man I'll, I should make little wallets <laughs> um and it was again like using these skills that my grandfather taught me like how to thread a needle and how to sew and just making objects making an object like it was again taking those polaroids that I collected and lamp like fake laminating them with with packing tape um with shoe goo I remember I used to use shoe goo when I skated to fix my shoes and kind of putting them in the windows. It was just this desire to make things. It wasn't for anything, it was just for friends. And I often would make these and give these away to friends. Um, and then like people saw that I was making things and were like, hey, Montour, can you make this, these little monkey things for our skin suits for bike race? Or, and this was like the first sewing machine I made, got them that time. And I had like a little, um, 
a contract with Cliff to make these bags out of banners. Um, and then I kind of started making like bigger objects, like a backpack. This is the one I made for my friend Jeff. And I realized by doing this that like from the last one doing the projection that I really like doing production. I kind of like doing decorative sewing. And so I, I really <laughs> got into the sewing of the bikes. It was like just, and there was no sketching. It was all like, it was like in this in this moment, like trying to speak my truth in the moment, just doing this repetitive, meditative practice with the with the regular sewing machine, no sketching, no no uh, backing on the fabric, and just I don't know, it just felt really like the movement was really therapeutic and calming for me. Uh, like I said, this one I drove a cab. <laughs> this was also when I first um, like was doing that decorative sewing. But I, and I was buying most of my material at the time from Scrap, which is at 801 Toland. If you all haven't been there, I encourage everyone to go there. Um, and just like, it was like, a, it's a thrift store, but it's for art supplies. And I remember like hearing about the place and going there and buying scraps of fabric. And, and <clears throat> then one day when I was driving a cab, I saw a man uh, at, in the back of Timbuktu, which at the time was on 16th and Alabama, pulling like little scraps of fabric and some bags out of the trash. And then I just realized I wanted to start collecting fabric from there instead. Um, so this is, a, this is a little out of order. I'm sorry, I'm gonna come back to this at one point. Um, and so with those little scraps of fabric, I was again, doing stuff that's decorative, like, like the narrative of like a friend of mine was having a kid, so a bias on the lamb, like the shura, like the, with praying, I, I don't know, which like still, like it still was attached to utility of, of art and making things. Um, and then like when I started making these larger pieces, there were like still these small pieces of fabric that were from the Timbuktu dumpster into these, I was like, this has to be a backpack. But then I realized when I, when I assembled all these little pieces of fabric that this is actually too nice and it will be destroyed. So like, again, like that's one of the things that happens in my art is like, I wanted, I always wanted it to be functional and not really believing in art in some ways. Like I, that's always been a struggle for me. Like art for art's sake, I was like, I, I was still struggling with like, it had to be functional. It had to be a bag. It had to be uh, on a sweatshirt. So like, this is, this is something that it, like I said, it's been a, a, a struggle for me the entire time I've been making art. Um, and this is more of those. I realized these things were so, these objects were so special that I, I, I wanted to start to make them bigger. I was like, this was kind of a shame to just have this in a pocket. Um, so in 2007, um, some friends had just known that I was like into making these little objects and bags and stuff. And so Fergus, Tanaka and Chewy um, were, were looking for a studio in the mission. They invited me to get this, have a studio with them. And so I, I agreed. At the time, it seemed like a lot. It was like 200 bucks to share a space with three other people. Um, but it was definitely a step up from working in the room which I was, in which I was living. Um, during that time, I think I, like right, it might have been right before or shortly after um, I joined them in the studio that I saw the Ellen Itsui piece at uh, the De Young. And also there was a big um, quilt of Guy's bin shell on the second floor. And these, these like, when I think when I fired both, I was like, my mind was completely blown. Mainly because of like, again, like with Alatsui, the use of materials, like the bottle caps, the copper wire, the wall sculpture, and just, I don't know, just the, the dynamism of the pieces and, and, and the palette. With the Guy's bin, I was really attracted to like, before I thought of one of the reasons I didn't like sewing was because of the precision. But just when I saw their pieces, thinking about the freedom, again, use of materials, a lot of like old mattresses, jeans. It was still utilitarian because there were blankets, at least initially. But I, I was just like, oh my God, maybe I should like take the sewing thing a little, a little more seriously. And like I said, I got the studio. And when I got the studio, like I said, after seeing that show and like the stress of my job. Um, like, when, like I said, when I started in the studio, I didn't really know what to do. I was like, oh my God, all, all of a sudden I have this space, I have this machine, but what am I gonna do? So I just started sewing little pieces of fabric together. Like it was like little tiny pieces that were maybe like 
a half an inch by two inches and just like zigzagging stitching them together. And again, like I said, a lot of my work has been like meditative, um, like processing what's happening. And this was something I did for seven years. I'll show you some slides later of what it became, but it was just the process of like what's happening in the cab, like a lot of the vicarious traumatization that was happening in the cab, like uh, like having to be hyper vigilant, worrying about like about doing these evaluations for trustworthiness of people. Um, also meeting a lot of beautiful people and amazing people through that. But it was like, this is something I did before and after I drove a cab for pretty much seven years. And there was no objective. It was just, it was just something I, like I said, I had to do it was like something I needed to do to keep myself healthy and sane. Um, again, like in, in the cab, like being in the cab, there were so many things like just seeing, and this was from the Crystal Screens Water Company. I think it's the well, it's Crystal Valley Water Company. It's like one of the, it was the water monopoly in San Francisco. Anyway, it's the, their corporate headquarters. It's on the corner, it's on the halfway, not on the corner. It's on Mason between Post and Geary. And it was a, bis, a building I probably passed by like like 10 times a day. But I just really like the 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 movement of the water cascading down the, the front of the the building, or at least the way it was rendered. And just kind of doing that, again, the drawing, the repetitive motion with fabric and with thread. Um, and then I, I unsuccessfully made it into a bag, but it was still that attachment to like, this has to be an object. Um, and then just, like I said, just, just doing these things, like they weren't for sale, they weren't for anyone, it was just for myself. It was just experiment and it's experimentation. I had the space, I had the materials and just taking chances and playing. Again, same thing, like, why did I make this? I don't, I don't know why I made it, I just made it. It was like, about, I was really obsessed with that show Lost and it was just like processing some, some of what I saw in Lost. Um, okay, and this is the, the blue piece uh, kind of at its conclusion. Um, I think it's like four feet by nine feet. Um, and again, this is processing what, what happened driving a cab. Um, and just again, like you can see the, the blues from the Guise band. You can see the sculptural elements from Elinatsui. Um, and I, I don't know, like I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with it, but there was like seven years worth of effort and work. So I'm glad to have something at the end of those seven years of driving a cab. It's like my own little medallion. This is my medallion. <laughs> if you don't know what a medallion is, a medallion is often like in lieu of having a retirement, um, oftentimes cab drivers can, they used to could sign up on the list, put their names on the list at the end of, like five or six years, you can get a medallion and cab companies will rent the medallions from you to have a cab on the road. So it was kind of like a little retirement. So this is my retirement gift to myself. I guess. Um, again, same, same, still bike racing, still playing. I still couldn't let myself go and make art. Um, so in the, what was it? In 2010, I've been driving a cab for four years. And I was like, I'm gonna make, I mean, the whole time I was like, I have to make a change. This isn't like a long, this isn't a career for me, but I, I was like really struggling to make the change. So I just remember every time a new city college catalog came out, I would always get it, but I was like, I don't know, you know? And then finally, and I think it was the spring of 2010, I decided to uh, go back to school. Um, and so I went to city college for like a year and a half, um, eventually like applied to graduate school, got in, and it was so hard. It was like really difficult for me to be in class. And one of the things I did when I was sitting in class was um, to kind of soothe, self-soothe in, in, in these graduate, graduate cinemas. I would uh, cut paper and make rings and make do these like obsessive doodles that I'll make into larger pieces. So it was like something because I think it was really difficult for me to be in that space, especially after being out of school, out of, out of school for more or less 10 years, 15 years. It was, some, it was a struggle. So it was really, really hard. And in the moment I needed something to kind of calm myself. And again, I fell back on being creative or using my hands to kind of help me through that period. Um, and this is the doodles. I just assembled them into like wall. It was something we're wall I took down recently. Um, again, like procrastinating, like doing things in my wall. Like I said, this talk, like I said, is about art and my life and me, and I'll get onto some of the textile pieces, but this is kind of another way I made made my way through graduate school was by doing these kind of tape drawings in my house. Whenever I felt like I was struggling or I wanted to procrastinate, instead of using the internet, I tried to do something creative. Um, again, 
like this was uh after again like playing with like i think this was like the centennial of the i think the world war one I, I can't remember if it was beginning or ending anyway so i remember seeing dazzle for the first time and i was like oh man i want to try it but these were like these were like i like i said obviously derivative but it was just like just doing this thing over and over again but by looking at the other side i kind of looked at it kind of made me realize the direction I want to go in for the future. And for me, the back side of these, a piece on the left is, is actually the right. And it reminded me of more like aerial landscapes. I, I don't know, it was just, I was like, oh, I, li I like this. I don't like the piece itself, but I like that. Um, again, more, more of the stuff I was doing in that period. I was like, I would always fall back. I would like make these games, like I'm gonna do something really great. And I would, I would get afraid, I would become afraid or I need to step, take a step back. And I would just do things that were a little more like controlled and predictable. And these were just wallets I made. And again, this is like, um, this was another piece I started. Um, when I, I think when I finished graduate school, it was like a backpack and I made it, but then I realized like no one's gonna buy a, a $700 backpack. And again, it was like, why I asked myself, why am I making these objects? Why, why what's, what's holding me back from just making art? What's holding me back from making these art pieces. Um, and I didn't mention this before, but one of the things when I was a child, my dad used to always tell me to like, he was a really belief in like colors and the meanings of colors. And so um, like this green was like, I was thinking of peace. I was thinking of serenity. I was thinking of calm. And the blue piece was kind of the same thing. I didn't mention this. I forgot to mention it, but like Blue was like calming for me, like always a color I thought of when I wanted to be calm. And so that's that's another function of the blue, especially when I was experiencing the stress of driving a cab. Um, again, so green, uh, wanted to make a, a piece, an object, so I made a backpack. Uh, but then I was like, I gotta cut this up. <laughs> and so I, I was like, I had the backpack and I just cut it up and I just made it into a wall hanging. Um, and then a friend of mine, like my friend Jeff, I mean, uh, Jeff, uh, uh, Jamie also knows him, like asked me, he saw it and he's like, do you wanna be in a show? Um, I hadn't really thought seriously about making art for shows or for me, art was just like a way I process things. It was like, it was something I felt good about but I didn't really have any interest in showing work. Um, so in 2015, he asked me to be in a group show. I was in the show and it kind of made me think more about uh, showing and it made me a little more confident and like making pieces just to be pieces. Um, again, this was, even the last one was more quilted, um, but I, again, I was playing with like materials and, and mapping like an imaginary aerial landscapes. Uh, this was in two, from 2015 as well. Um, but I think I was reluctant to do quilting because it was the time investment and I wasn't sure if I went to go that direction or not. Um, so again, I was playing with, I liked the forms that were, that were uh, in high relief, um, but I the, the challenge I had was how, did that, how do I have them be self-supporting without having any kind of like intermeshing or backing or, or chicken wire or something like that or plastic to support them. That's more of that. And it was like lots of figuring out the, the, the mapping, the structures, but I, I felt like it was missing something. And so I, I tried a bunch of things, like at least to, to help with the structures of the pieces. And this is like plastic. I, I didn't really like it ultimately. And so, and then I tried like making them into pillows. That was also didn't really work. Um, and then I went back to the quilting. And this was from 2016. This was a small piece. Again, it's from scraps from Tim Timbuktu. Like they, they eventually moved and I figured out the schedule when they dropped the fabric in there and I would just go pick up the fabric. And again, it was just like quilting, but it was more like improvisational <laughs> quilting on top. Um, so just kind of drawing, I have a good plan. Um, just, just choosing colors based on the way I felt, um, what I saw, what I was experiencing. Um, this was something from that same period, but this is all scraps. These are all scraps from other pieces that I made. And I, I was like, just again, about like recycling, how do I not generate waste? How do I not make waste of waste, but make more pieces out of, out of my own waste? 
Um, and included are some like gold pieces. Like I had said, I had all these pieces, these things or directions I went with my work that I would sometimes start, stop, start, stop. This, uh, there was a period of time where I was really interested in the works of uh, Bar Barnaby Conrad. I don't know if anyone has ever read him. He was like um, really into bullfighting and, and uh, uh, I don't know, what's, what is it called? Oh my God, it's been a while. Anyway, so he was really into bullfighting. I was really fascinated by the coats of lights that the bullfighters were and like the pattern, pattern tree, even though it's brutal, but it, uh, brutal, but it was really beautiful to me. And so like I had some experiments with like buying gold thread and playing with it. Again, these are like more imaginary maps. Like these were the early ones. Um, but this one was like a little, it was based on like something I heard from the radio, but it was like still not personal. And I realized the strength of work and stories are when it has to do with you. It's not someone else. It's not, for me, it was like, where is the artist and the work? And so for me, um, this, this, this was like, an, for me, I think it was a pivotal point was realizing like my stories are important, my experiences are important, how I relate to other people is important, the impact I have on other people is important to me. Um, and then how do I how do I like process what I'm experiencing and make it into work? So at the time I was working at Edgewood Centers for Children. It was like a residential care facility. Uh, and I had a job where I would go into the community and work with kids who were um, struggling with behavioral problems in public schools. And I would go and coach them in school and I would go coach them at home, coach the parents. So a lot of it was building these relationships with children and parents because it was like, like who am I to give someone advice about how to raise their child or aunt, I mean, uh, not aunt, or grandchild. Um, but this was about um, a child that I worked with there who he told me after we'd been working with each other for like a month and a half that when he first met me, he was really afraid of me. And I was like, why? And he told me that it was because I was wearing an orange backpack. And um, and he said that uh, the color orange really freaked him out. And so orange represented fear for him because every time he saw his dad, his, his dad would always be a, wearing an orange jumpsuit when he would visit him, in, I think in Santa Clara jail. Um, so the, the map or the path for me was just thinking about the work and the gains that I made with this student over the course of me working with him for three months, but how that had come to an abrupt end when I decided to quit working that job, because even though I had a master's degree, I think I was making $18 an hour and it was really hard for me to, uh, because I felt like my poverty was paralleling the poverty of this child, which was a lot, I felt like was a lot of, was, was responsible for a lot of the, the things he was experiencing was uh, being impoverished. Um, so like this was, like I said, this was powerful for me just to process that event in my life, that relationship. Uh, and, and like to, it was important to me, like the same way that the photographs were like capturing moments or people. I felt like the pe these piece, this piece was like capturing a moment, a relationship, a period of time. Um, this again was that same period after Edward Centers for Children, like feeling like a drift, feeling adrift again, like, where am I going? I'm not driving a cab anymore. Um, I have this degree, but where am I going with it? <laughs> you like, can I find more than jobs that are like, either here's an internship where you can get hours and it's $13 an hour, or you can get hours and it's zero. So it's like, like finding, how do I find my way? Like, as I was finding my way, document the process of finding my way. This is called Green Path. But I was also at the time reading a lot about like these uh, Quilombos, reading about Colombos and maroon colonies um, and Gaspar Yanga in Mexico. So just thinking about like, like finding my way, but also thinking about like how people that were enslaved, like escaped, just, this is a known, they didn't know where they were going, but just, just finding their way, finding their way of finding community. And I don't know, this was, like I said, some of this contains <clears throat> Uh, pieces from old pieces like I remember I showed I don't know there was a slot some slides way back where it was like I said there was a backpack I started to make so eventually I cut up that backpack and include portions of this into this piece as well so just like I don't know just like not for me that's important too is like when something's not working or I can't figure out how to make it work cutting it up and put it aside and maybe using it later in a different piece um so like I said, <laughs> I feel like this is a strange turn after after that that other work. 
is making these dolls. Um, the dolls kind of started, uh, like I said, I was hustling, trying to find work. Um, and it was before I decided to get a credential in school counseling. And so I was offered a job to teach at a, a, um, a private elementary school, an after school program. And um, I talked to the kids and they want, they want to make dolls. So it was like me teaching myself how to make dolls. And these are really simple primitive dolls. And I just kind of was using scrap material that I got from Timbuktu and teaching them how to make dolls. But eventually, like through the process of teaching myself how to do it, I kind of just got really into it. It was like, because I felt like sometimes there was so much weight or like, I, I, like even going to the studio and working on these pieces that were deeply personal and were loaded emotionally, it was hard to do that sometimes. And so to be in the studio, it was good to have something that that I could just do that was almost mindfulness or repetitive, but also creative at the same time. Um, and I just got really into it. I think at this point I have like, may have like over a hundred of these dolls, but <clears throat> again, using materials, like some of the materials we use, like these were like, uh, I don't know if I don't have my pointer, but the pattern, the African pattern was like a dashiki I used to wear until, until I grew out of it. <laughs> um, and then, uh, the white be the white beard is my dad. Um, I've always had like a, I've received a lot from my dad, like good and bad. But my dad, um, his leg was amputated because he had um, he had vascular disease, and so um, this was like, I just wanted to make an object because sometimes my dad is difficult to deal with. So this was like a not just a displacement object but it was also an object for healing. So these kind of, I made a couple for relatives and friends as well. They have pockets on the back. So whenever um, I was experiencing like trouble or thing I couldn't say to my dad, but I needed to like uh, get it out, I would just write it on a piece of paper and put it in the pocket on the back of the doll, just to kind of help me process what was happening with him and my own emotions. Uh, this is another piece that's kind of related again about processing emotions. Um, this. Like I said, a lot of these pieces and the stories are kind of overlapping and about me and my life. This is about like, I called it avoiding triangulation. Um, when I was a child, I was triangulated a lot with my dad, grandma, mom, uh, forced to choose sides a lot. It was like really crazy making. And that was one of the reasons I actually went to New Mexico. But this is something I've experienced throughout my life with these situations or housemates or whatever. And so like, this is like figuring out a plan how to avoid triangulation, how to not be overwhelmed when I'm putting these double binds. Okay, um, that's a slightly better picture. Um, and again, work around narrative about what I'm experiencing. This, um, again, was that period before I became a school counselor, uh, trying to figure out what I'm doing, where am I going? And at the time I was listening to an on the media, uh, it was like a short series I had called, um, uh, oh my God, what was it called? It's, uh, anyway, I'll, it'll come to me later. Uh, and so this is called Love, Luck, and Support. And I was thinking about what am I thankful for? Why have I, what am I thankful? Like love, like so much love. I've been the recipient of so much love throughout my life. And um, I don't know, I was thinking that's that's something that's definitely helped me, kept me afloat. I've had a lot of good luck, like had bad luck too, but a lot of good luck and like, like come through some really difficult things. Um, and then like having a lot of people that have supported me not just love, but people like strangers, acquaintances, friends that have supported me. So just uh, after hearing about like America's poverty myths, about hearing about a lot of people struggling, hear about a lot of people who aren't recognizing their privilege, I was just reflecting on what am I thankful for in this moment? How have I gotten here? And this is just love, luck and support. Uh, it still has elements of uh, like the projections. Uh, it's using some, some mostly outdoor fabrics, but some upholstery fabrics. Uh, the forms, I, it was just like what, what came to me in the moment, what felt good. Uh, experimenting with overstitching, like, I don't know, I was thinking about like spider webs, like I was thinking about like uh, traffic patterns. I was thinking about like, uh, at, at one point the Exploratorium collaborated with Yellow Cab and the, it was called cab spotting. It was like on a map where every time a cab went over an area, it would, it would uh, gradually change from black to white. And so I was thinking about that um, doing this, but mainly was reflecting on love, luck and support. Um, again, for that show, again, playing with leather, I always felt like I had, a, I had access to a lot of leather, but I didn't want to do with it. So just making like these little small objects. This was actually before the dolls. 
And this was um, a piece, The Nados. I think this was like a year and a half of my life. Um, this was kind of reflecting on, like after I'd been working as a therapist in San Francisco Unified and working as a counselor, it was kind of just, um, again, thinking about clients I had, thinking about friends I had, thinking about like things I see in society, especially in youth and like the move towards self-destruction. Um, and I don't know, we're just like, like figuring out how do you find ways out? How do you help people who are struggling? I don't know, this is like, again, my meditation. That was something I gave, let myself do for like a year and a half. This is nine feet by 17 feet. And it's just little, little pieces of fabric. It was just, like I said, it was my meditation. Um, it was something I felt just compelled to do. Um, I, don't know, I don't know what else to say about this piece. It's like, when I look at it now, I'm like, this is, wow, this is, this is crazy. Um, but uh, again, it was making, for me, from the perspective of like making something that's pretty much unsellable, but it was just like I needed to do it. It wasn't about commerce. It was just about like the need to create something. Um, and then I was, again, like after I made that Thanatos piece, I wanted a break, I wanted something more concrete. So I was thinking a lot about like Chicago and the high rise buildings I saw when I was a child, when I get on the freeway, they were like dominated the skyline uh, where I lived, at least from where I lived. Um, and just thinking about like how much movement there was crime, but I just remember a joy when I went up into the project and stories and noise and I don't know, activity and life. Um, but also I thought about like when I made this piece, um, like the class divide and even within my own family, like just class and how privileged I was and how the opportunities I had. And this was a, a kind of a, rem a rendering of Ida B. Wells projects, which was across the street from where I went to elementary school. And uh, like the people I went to school with were all middle class, upper middle class, but across the street were people who are really black, really poor, really struggling. Um, and just again, thankful for what I had the opportunity to experience. Um, and I, I just remember just those, none of those risers are around, they were all demolished in the early nineties, I believe. Um, but just, it was just, again, reflecting on the past and what, I, what, what I'm thankful for right now. Um, and then in 2019, I was lucky enough to be se selected um, as an artist in residence or ecology. I encourage anyone to apply for it, student or not. It's an incredible experience, just like in terms of the number of inputs, there was so much, it was just so much material, electronics. It was like to try anything. The only bad thing was that it was only three months. So <laughs> I'm someone whose practice usually takes a long time and it was a bit overwhelming. I, I, I did a thing that I usually do, like it was so overwhelming when I first got to ecology. I think I spent eight hours every day just out there, just talking, just being out in the PRA just the transportation, just to get used to it. Cause it was just like, just, I don't know, it kind of broke my heart just seeing all this material about to go to landfill, like stuff that's usable, that's fine, but just, we live in a throwaway society. Um, but one of the things that I really enjoyed when I was here was the opportunity to talk to workers, to talk to people who were, who were throwing things away. Um, I felt like there was a story every day, whether it was someone, the most important and heartening things for me were where people who were disposing of a relative's things, the last of their things. And just, this was like, the, the bodies were long in the ground, but these objects where there was a set of plates, you could just see people like this is, they were letting go. This is the last rites for the body was gone, but it was like the things were the last, truly the last things to go. Um, so I found like some incredible funeral cards. There was a woman who made funeral cards for people in the Fillmore and uh, Bayview. And there were like literally thousands of them. Um, and I got those from her. Um, another, we're just talking to some of the workers. Um, one of the workers was talking about ancestors. And then it made me kind of reflect on my own past. And it was kind of like, that was an aha moment when I was there, which is thinking about past history. Um, not necessarily the history of, um, not the history of like pain and suffering, but also like, how did I get here? Who is responsible for help, helping me get to this place I am right now? Uh, I'll, I'll, this will all come together, but I'm gonna show you another slide. 
again, this was another thing I remember seeing. This is on Chicago on the south side, was just the rust. Like I just always loved rust. And the way, it, like it's, it's kind of the water, the way the water cascaded down the side of the wall, just this rust pattern. It was something, like I said, that was ubiquitous driving on the freeway or driving around town. Um, um, so this was, I mean, this is one of the finds from the dump. These were awnings. So sometimes you go into the PRA and you see people dumping random things. That was something I gathered and you'll see why later. Um, this is one of the rust pieces. So when I got to the dump, um, one of my daily practices, again, like I was saying, when I first got the studio, I didn't really know what direction I was going. I just kind of just started doing something. And so when I got to the dump, I had a, a sketch of what I wanted to do, but it was just overwhelming, like I said. So the first thing I did was gather uh, metal and just started rusting material. Like every day, I made like a little rust farm in the back. It was a huge patio. It was maybe like 45 feet by 30 feet. And I just started placing fabric, tarps, and uh, put tarps down, um, material, iron, steel, whatever I found in the metal recycling and sprayed it down with peroxide, uh, vinegar, uh, ammonia, whatever, and call it, sprayed it down with water and then just started rusting whatever material. So I had like a little rust farm and eventually I made like a long rust piece. Um, I don't know, it was just, it was just, like I said, it was just past, it was like my, my, um, my diary, it was my rust diary. This is something I did every day when I was there. Um, and this, this was something that was a little more work intensive. And this was a piece that's about, um, like I said, the man from Mali, uh, Usman, um, was talking about his ancestor cave. And it was pretty incredible, like his story, he was telling me this place where there were all these different levels where you'd have to talk to someone and they'd open a door and it would have statues of other, they open up, they have statues of ancestors. And then there was another door you can get to to, to maybe to, uh, see statues or, or hear stories about more elevated uh, ancestors. So this is about like migration. It's about fleeing the Jim Crow South. Um, my great grandparents fleeing uh, Mississippi racial violence or Mississippi in the rural on the right, and then uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma in the 1920, 1921 uh, on the left. Um, thinking about my place in it, thinking about shame, thinking about uh, people fleeing, like the drinking gourd that's in there. That's kind of a cliche, but it was in there. I was thinking about like, what are signs that go north? Why were people drawn north? What, it wasn't just economics. It was just like having family, knowing people, safety. Um, again, any place better than the place you are. Um, and again, this was made from materials like family Bibles. I found some family Bibles there, uh, old silk screens, tarps, those that stack, welding curtains, um, upholstery, like fishing vests, like <laughs> on the backside, they're um, olfactory. Um, uh, it's, it's like stimulus in the back. It's like uh, some of the plants I found in the uh, gardening section there. Uh, there's also uh, photographs of like clan rallies that I find that are like embedded in the back of it. Also wigs and extensions is like a sign of shame, internalized oppression, internalized racism that were in the back. Um, yeah, this is this is something I was I was really really happy with. Again, it's and the the colors I, I intentionally chose the colors because the colors are a little bit of a misdirection. The colors are a lot of times when people see this piece, they're like, oh, I love the colors. Or what the colors are so beautiful, but it's it's the colors are whiteness. The colors are blonde hair. The colors are the pink, like light skin, green eyes, blue eyes. So it's like you're drawn in because of like the way people are drawn in is because it's like lovely to them or it's beautiful, um, but it's not about that. Um, okay. And these are two more pieces I made when I was there. These were just, again, like like a little less meaning, but just more of like, just 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 trying to work a little bit faster. Um, they're, they're named after Madonna songs. So you go for something that's really serious to like, again, letting go of like, Okay, I do something that's playful. I need that like that was really hard to make this piece, so I'm gonna do something that's a little more playful. Um, again, this was like something I didn't show there that was incompleted, but I think it's important for me to look at what didn't work, why. Um, this was made out of um, drum heads. Uh, when I was at college, I saw these people throwing out drum drum heads and rattan chairs, which were two things that I used to always think were really valuable. But you, when you go to the dump, you just see people throwing them away or 
trash in them. And so it was just an attempt to make something. Like I said, it wasn't successful, but it was something I, I did. This is the back of one of those two pieces. Uh, uh, I can't remember if, if this is, uh, oh my God, which one is this called? Anyway, it's, it's, it's one of the pieces I just showed. Um, this is a reflection of that, um, of this piece. Um, so I was, when I, after I showed the piece and told the story, there was a worker at Recology whose family was from the same town in Mississippi that my great grandparents were from, my maternal great grandparents were from. And they were just talking about their own family. Um, they were a white person and they were wondering what their family's role was at the same time. And so this is called like just reflection. So it's it made me think of mirror, like in Snow White, mirror, mirror on the wall. Um, and just listening to them talk and, and having, I know it was important for me to like have someone think about the work I made and then like I have a conversation that came from that. Um, this was a, something I was working on. Now, um, this was really hard for me because it was like a commission. It's, it's probably gonna get cut up, but I realized it's hard for me when I have another voice in my head um, to make work and so that's something that, that's like a struggle of mine is like how to listen to my voice but not have too much noise when people want a specific thing from me. Um, and this is uh, what another thing I have that's happening right now is I have, it's a, kind of suspended, but I have a residency with the San Francisco Arts Commission, but it's uh, working with the SF planning department. So um, I'm doing work around uh, public space and informal use of public space. But uh, I was really struggling with that with COVID and then the smoke kind of put a, a damper on the work I was doing in the community. And so as a result, I kind of looked inward, like trying to make a map, trying to figure out what's, what, the, what am I doing right now? What's going on right now? And so I worked on this piece. Um, I don't know if it's going to be for that at all, but it was like, again, like me reverting to the familiar. The familiar is mapping. The familiar is doing what's kind of comfortable. And so this was like, again, me processing like social unrest, processing COVID, processing smoke, processing working from home, processing being at home. <laughs> you know what I mean? So this was like what I did to, just to kind of get through because I was like, I, I didn't know what's happening in my own life. I don't know what's happening in the world. Um, and I think that's it. Whoa, man, sorry, thank you. Sorry, man, it was a lot. <laughs> no, thank you. It's, thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's really perfect. Um, before I open up uh, the Q&A, and uh, I think what's most effective is maybe for people to just chat their questions if they have them, and then Mansoor can read them um, and answer them. But I just want to first off say thank you, Mansoor, and, and thank you for being so generous, not just with um, showing us your work, but like opening yourself up and being being honest and personal and, and emotional and all of those things with us. It's very generous. Yeah. I really appreciate that. And I have some notes about things that I sort of wanted to touch back on, but I'd like to let um, other people, if they want to open the chat, um, go ahead and type some stuff. And then are you able to see the chat, Mansoor? Yeah, I can, I can see it. Oh yeah, thank you, Ms. Opara, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Have questions? Oh, why don't you go ahead and start, Jamie, if no one, no one. Well, one of the things that I thought that I think, well, I mean, it's been a while since I talked to you about your work. Um, I really appreciate this, this sort of how open you are about like just your struggles with process and, and also confronting um, sort of the inner conflict of making art for art's sake and sort of have this, this constant reliance on this thing of like going back and going to the things that are familiar and, and that journey of like sort of slowly accepting you kind of like accepting yourself as an artist <laughs> you know and and I'm sort of <clears throat> um I guess that's more of a statement um but I guess one of the things that I think is you talked a lot about play 
in this in the studio and I think you do so much intuitive work and and when you play in the studio do you feel like um I don't know do you feel like you're sort of set in this way now or do you feel like there's still these opportunities for you to like find new ways of working or new materials to work with or you know how do you sort of how do you sort of cope with that like right now in your practice I know that's that's like the biggest struggle is like right because it like I was saying it's that struggle like like following up what you're saying like I didn't even touch on all these conflicts I have right so even when I started at UNM I was studying I was in my second year of biology major before mm -hmm. like I had a dis personal disaster happen like a tra traumatic loss and then I was like I gotta go back to art you know what I mean? So it was like, that was like, so I feel like there's always adjustments, but it's like always come back to art in terms of practice. So right now um, it's like, I don't know. Like, I feel like, I don't know if anyone, I'm sure other people experience this, but it's like my body resists any kind of change. I'm like, resist, I'm like, resist. It's like, wait, why don't you try something new? It's like, nah, wait, wait, I'm going to do this thing that's familiar really quick. But it's also like, it, it's just like, it just makes me, I realize for me, change has to be gradual. And like taking little chances and then retreating, taking little chances and retreating. And so for for me, like right now, the hardest thing about my practice, like I was saying, is I was shifting my practice to be when I was working over in Bayview, was being more trying to utilize these skills I have from like driving a cab and working as a counselor. So interpersonal skills, building relationships. But I'm still like struggling to ask people to record them because I don't want, I'm not. I'm not trying to extract. I don't want my work to be extractive. So that that's a hard balance for me. Is like, how do I get these narratives? How do I ask people to take photographs without? I don't want to exploit people too. So that's, I'm trying to make that shift to different like photo, like back to photography, but in a different way. I don't, I don't know. And also like oral oral histories. So that's a slow shift I'm trying to make. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And it's, I don't know, I, I do, I don't know. I, I do feel like, like I wanna, I wanna make a shift, but it's just like figuring out what's specific too. But I think it's just being open to trying so many things. Like right now, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, no. Well, I guess I was gonna say the other thing that's sort of like, that I wrote down that is sort of connected to that and is also kind of a question about like, you know, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, sort of, and I have such fond memories of this, of like being in the art building at UNM late at night and just being part of this crew that like was really like, we saw this kind of dedication in each other. And I think that that was part of what bonded us. And like, and also this idea of like putting in the time and, and that especially now your work is so sort of time intensive and thinking about making a piece over seven years or making a piece over five years or making a piece over a year and a half or whatever that is. And, and sort of, do you find specific, like now during COVID, are you spending more time in the studio than you might otherwise? Or are you, and, and, are, and do you pull those late nights still? Uh, no, I'm like the opposite. I'm like, I can't, like COVID has been like, I don't, I don't know, I'm not gonna say, yeah, I won't say that. I won't say what I was about to say. But I was like, COVID has really affected me like in a number of ways, like emotionally, psychologically, my practice, um, like physically, like I was sick earlier. Um, mm -hmm. But it's it's been really hard for me because I have to spend all days inside. And like, if I'm at my house doing like working on Zoom calls, making calls, it's hard for me to be motivated in my studio. Mm -hmm. So I'm really struggling with that. Like, so I'm still, I'm still like, let's say I was at my studio 25 hours a week or 40 hours a week during the summer. Now it's probably, I'm lucky if I'm doing 10, right? Because I'm also like trying to ride my bike more to exercise so I don't get sick, you know? Um, but one thing I have been doing, like you're aware of this is figuring out other ways, like I was saying before, during these transitional periods, like how do I still engage my voice? How do I still, how do I, how am I still being creative, right? And so the things I was doing, like the MPSF, that was a short lived thing. I did it for a month and a half, mm. but just like still like in that case, like taking photographs of, of empty apartments. Um, I've also started a thing where I'm like- Can you can you talk about MPSF a little bit? Explain to oh, people. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I, one thing I noticed, it was like, maybe it was this in, I think it was in February or March when 
uh, I started seeing moving vans everywhere. It was like where I live in the Lower Haight in San Francisco. And I remember just riding my bike down Steiner Street and being like, I look down Page and you look either side and you'll see like five moving vans on, on each block. You're like, what the, it was like people, it was a mass exodus. And I wish I'd captured that, but I thought of the idea from MPSF when one day I was just riding my bike around and I was looking up and I just saw like, I'd, I'd go on like, let's say in the mission on like Folsom between 20th and 21st. Sorry, I still talk like a cab driver. It's always like cross streets, right? <laughs> but I'd, I'd be on these blocks and I'd look up and I'd be like, oh my God, look at all these empty apartments, right? But then also, for me, like one thing I noticed is like so many houseless people, right? And also thinking about like how, since I've lived in the Bay Area, how I've struggled with the place to live and how those empty apartments are still inaccessible to most people. <laughs> and they were taking off the market for tech uh, directly or indirectly through, air, or like, in, I guess, directly through Airbnbs and, and expensive apartments and how they're inaccessible. And so for me doing that, that was, I realized that was also causing me a lot of stress as well. <laughs> like every day documenting these, these empty apartments, but realizing that when I would do research on them, they're still $3,000, you know, or 2,700 bucks. So I put an end to that just cause it was like, it was really a struggle. I was, it was causing me harm, you know, <laughs> to do that project. Um, so then I, I started making music too now. I'm not a musician, but that's something I'm doing. Now. <laughs> But it's still like trying to, like you're saying, like that's something when I think of UNM that I was like, so I want to go back. Like I said, I think it's important for me to, to give thanks to people. And Valerie Hollingsworth was someone that played a pivotal role in that happening for me, making that happen. Because she was someone who gave me that job at the photo cage. And by having the job at the photo cage, I could get keys to the building. So I didn't have to stay. I, I didn't have to like be there before five to hold my place. I could leave and go home and then come back you know and then stay until two in the morning and then seeing you and like I think in the whole art building there are like six people who stayed late out of all the students at UNM it was pretty incredible you know so. yeah I mean those are some of the I think some of the best definitely the best memories from being at school and also some of the most productive times of my art career you know like I feel like we were productive in this way you know, and we had a lot of energy. We were like in our early 20s and, you know, um, I don't know, it, there was a lot of socializing and a lot of, and it just a lot of, I feel like I really learned how to be an artist in that moment, you know? And I think, <clears throat> I mean, one thing I think too, that I totally appreciate about this presentation and just like knowing you for so long and sort of seeing these sort of fits and starts in your career and sort of see you've really come into your own in some ways over the last decade yeah. you know and 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 i don't know it feels really special to have that kind of long relationship even if it hasn't totally been constant the whole time and i'm sort of what i'm getting at i guess is to sort of let the students know that are watching you know, how important the relationships that you are, that you build when you're in art school, when you're in school or like this time in your life. And like, you know, even though it's difficult, particularly right now, you know, that you have this opportunity to build these relationships that can be like, you know, lifelong. Um, and, and it's exciting to see someone's like practice change and evolve over that kind of period of time because I think you know I remember I still have this um your that that little card that you made when you were driving your calling card that you made <laughs> in a taxi and like that I I I really associated you as being sort of almost more of like a graphic novelist or cartoonist or that sort of more of an illustrative kind of artist at that time and like now like you might still be drawing sometimes or using your sketchbook, but like really your practice, your drawing practice is sewing. Yeah. You know, and I love that idea thinking about the relationship between drawing and sewing. Yeah, I think like, like I was gonna, I was gonna follow up with the, the question real fast, but I was thinking about that too. Like one thing I was like, if I was talking to students really quickly is like, just how important it is just to maintain that practice. And that was the thing I learned from, man, it almost makes me teary-eyed to think about just like being at UNM, right? 
and just like just putting in the time like it was f this last minute stuff it was just like just being there every day making yourself available because like by putting in the time inspiration can come inspiration comes by doing for me it comes by doing by being in motion not rushing to do something at the last minute but it's just like every day just doing a little bit right mm -hmm. and and the drawing practice i felt like that's more of like it's kind of addressing a question i was asking but it was more about like those are the circumstances. Like I didn't have a studio. So all of a sudden my studio space became my little sketchbook that I used to carry in my back pocket everywhere I went. You know what I mean? It was like, I don't know. It was like, it's like, I just feel like, it's like, I don't know, it sounds cheesy, but it makes me think of like the beginning of this DJ Shadow. Do you remember that J DJ Shadow album introducing? Yeah, you were the one, you, were, you and Erica, yeah, yeah. I remember he was like, there's a, there's a sample of a, a drummer and he's talking about, the music comes through me or something. And I feel like art mm -hmm. is like that, where it's just like this thing just comes through me and it's like figuring out a way to challenge, channel it into whatever. And that's why it's hard to channel it sometimes into a new thing because I'm comfortable with the thing I'm doing now. I don't know, I was a little bit out there, but whatever, you got me. So can you read these questions and then kind of address them? Yeah, I'm um, thinking about space. Um, so I want to clarify, ask a clarifying question about, are you referring to space in the piece or space and context. Um, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I would say I was thinking about space in the piece, but it, I mean, even from what you just said, it sounds like space, um, like internally and externally, it sounds like there's like a back and forth. But yeah, I was when I first asked that, I was thinking about that. Okay. Yeah. So in this in the space, it's funny. Like one of the things that I'm struggling with, it's like, maybe it's, it's something I'm holding on to is just like control, like I want to control these little pieces of fabric. And that's, that's something I'm trying to be more aware of is like, I don't have to like do these little, I have more space. I don't have, I have a whole wall. I don't have to make these tiny objects. And so that's my thing is like, okay, I can have varying sizes of fabric. I don't have to work with little pieces that are small, but that's just something I'm holding on to and I, I need to think about more why why I'm doing that. That's my own control. And maybe it's like I was talking to a friend. Sorry, everything turns into a story with me. So <laughs> I was talking to a friend about like um just like how sometimes we 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 procrast we get involved in these things that are like really, really elaborate schemes to procrastinate. And maybe sometimes I'm doing these really small squares because I'm afraid of doing the big thing or I'm afraid of it ending. And so sometimes doing the small little thing can be a way of holding on to this piece, holding on to this moment because I don't know what's coming next. So I, is that, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's just me, that, that's what I think. That's what I think. So if I'm looking at myself that way, that's what I think. Um, and drawing, answer your question about drawing. It's funny. Uh, I don't plan anything. <laughs> I don't plan anything. That's my rule. I don't make plans. Um, so the way it works is like, I it's like listening to that inner voice. And that goes back to the cap thing, right? Is like listening, when I'm making a primary, secondary, tertiary assessment of a person for safety, it's like listening to that voice. What does my voice say? Why am I saying that? Am I afraid? Am I like my bias is coming out? What what is it about this person? And then challenging those. And the same happens with the piece. When I make a little, when I'm starting a piece, I put it on the wall. What do I think of? What do, how am I responding to it? And then making a change. Maybe that didn't work. I'm gonna cut it out. Maybe I'm gonna add something else. So it's it's a lot of this like dialogue with the piece, myself, and where I'm at. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> okay, let me see. Um Oh, um, so I want to talk to Jonah's um, question. Um, yeah, that's, whew, I don't know. that. I think, like I said, the shift, I feel like there's always a shift. That's always a struggle is like the functional and artistic. Um, I think, like I said, the moment was with that backpack. When I showed the picture of that green backpack, that was when I realized like, this is, this is too labor intensive. To be, I just imagine, I just imagine like what's gonna happen to a backpack over time. Like, it's gonna get thrown around, it's gonna get dirty, it's gonna look horrible. And I was like, this is almost too precious to be a backpack. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, for me, it was more of like, I don't, I want this to live in a more pristine space. I don't want it to be functional. You know, it's almost too beautiful, too precious to be a piece of functional art. That's that's how it was for my case. You know, and again, maybe that's the control piece. Is like 
it becomes something. So it's safer to make something. But that's that's a struggle I still have. I, I feel like uh, I was talking about this with Jamie and I was also telling him, I was thinking about this too, was like, there are also all these internal struggles, right? So like for me in my life, it's like what class, like grandparents, uh, black middle class conformist, father, lower middle class progressive, right? So those are conflicts. Uh, my mom's queer, my dad's a homophobe, another conflict, you know? So there are all these conflicts, functional art, art. It's those are just, they're just that, you know? But also like thinking about like, where am I in there, right? Where am I in these spaces? And just really thinking about, and sometimes giving myself over to it. Maybe I need to make, I need to make functional art to realize I don't want to make functional art. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I hope that answered the question. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a teacher of the drums too. <laughs> I was hoping that would be my intro. That the beginning, that building a building steam. Uh, so anyway. <laughs> also, Mansoor, I guess I just want to sort of say this thing of like, you know, talking about value and talking about a, a utilitarian object that has too much value, right? versus this idea that art doesn't have any value or that, that you know, in thinking and deciding like the personal struggle of finding self value yeah. that you're sort of pretty open about and like how those things are all kind of married together and like these struggles with like capitalism and struggles with, you know, I, you know, I, you didn't talk about this at all, but like you, you know, this, your whole experience of driving for Uber, like, you know, losing your sort of cab job that was like a good job because of Uber and then sort of doing some organizing in the beginning of Uber and all of that stuff is like all very tied up in that too, I think. And it's, you know, it's just, it's, it's such an interesting, for someone who's known you for a long time, it's such an interesting um, thing to be able to so clearly see the evolution of a person and the work together. Yeah, but that's that's a piece I was talking about earlier is that they're all connected, right? And it's like I was saying, like it's it's all connected. I can't speak about art without speaking about my life and myself. Like, I don't know, I kind of don't want them to be separated. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, I don't know, this is a little bit of a tangent, but it just makes me think like, of just like, I don't know, like, like slowing, I don't know, has anyone read Invisible Man? Everyone read that book, Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. Oh, yeah. uh, anyway, there's a part when he talks about um, he talks about Louis Armstrong and that there's like a song, uh, Kind of Blue or something. And he talks about like, when you listen to it, it's like slowing down time. And I just think about like, sometimes art is my way of slowing down time or stopping time. And so, I don't know. I feel like there's so much happening around me in my life, in the world. And sometimes it's a way to slow down time and get in time and hear all these other things and see all these other things. So, but yeah, sorry, I got embarrassed. <laughs> um, let me see, I'm trying to think of one other thing that's that I think is really important about the work. Um, I don't know. I think it's just like you're saying, it's just doing, doing the work. Um, and so one thing about value that I think is important for me is the struggle I've had is like, like, like I said, value with these objects, but now it's a different kind of assessment of value is like, now it's like, how much is my time worth, right? If I'm doing these giant pieces and someone from a gallery, they tell me how much it's worth. That's, that's traumatizing to me, right? Cause that's going back to the Uber Lyft thing where like, no, you don't get to decide the value of this thing. Maybe I won't deal with you. Maybe I should just do grants from now on out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause that's happened before. And then the gallery model too, this challenging is, so if I spend all this time on a piece and then a gallery takes half and then I have to take, I have to pay 30% of that half to in taxes. So that's another piece when assessing my value, how much time it's worth. Maybe I should just give this piece to a friend sometimes or donate it, donate it to something, you know? So yeah, that, that's for me, that was, that was, that often brings up when I have that talk about pricing and stuff, it's also like traumatizing because it brings back the Uber, <laughs> Uber Lyft where like a capitalist, someone who has means get to tell me what my time and my energy is worth, you know, so yeah. I won't even get started with that. That's a, that's a topic I try not to 
uh, discuss too much. It's triggering. It's like... <laughs> So we should probably wrap it up. We're at an hour and 15 minutes, but if. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, it went by fast, right? Oh, wow. That's seems time to slow down again. <laughs> so I just, you know, Monster, I just, I want to thank you. I felt sad that I haven't seen you in a long time, but glad that I get to see you right now. Um, you know what? Can I say one thing, Jamie? I want to cut in because I can't keep my mouth shut. Uh, is. <laughs> Thank you so much. It, for me, it's like time is passing, but I'm glad that I have genuine connections to people. Like they're people I haven't seen in like 10 years, you know, like, but like when you see them, it's so beautiful. It's so amazing. So. Yeah. And I've always felt that even all those times that I ran into you just randomly in San Francisco over the, you know, 10 years. Um, and I'm just so glad that, you know, things worked out that the way that they have and we have a connection these days <laughs> um and that's a story for another time that all of you can ask me in, in part person. two part yeah. two <laughs> so thank you so much um no thank you for having me i really really thank you for having me i really i'm so honored deeply honored that and um i will just say if anybody who's here um wants to ask further questions of mansoor or um get in touch with you or know about what's going on, on with you, feel free to reach out to me at CCA. Yeah. And, um, I can put you in touch. Yeah, let me know. Like if uh, if you have something, hopefully COVID is resolved this year. <laughs> no, in person, like keep me in mind in the future. Yeah. yeah. So thanks well, everybody for coming and thank you, Mansoor. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Turn, turn off your... your um, My screen sharing. Unmute yourself and give Mansoor a round of applause. That's a nice way to end. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Mansoor. You're welcome.